Small modular reactors. Canada is investing $700 million in them. The US Department of Energy has awarded over a billion dollars. The UK is investing 385 million pounds or more. China's building them. Russia has floating ones. We're in the biggest expansion of nuclear energy in 50 years and it's going to save the planet. Or is it all just a little bit of hype? Let's investigate a little more deeply and see what we can find out. Welcome everyone, my name is Michael, and we've seen calls in the past for a nuclear renaissance. The last one was in the late 2000s, and that, as you might remember, was cut short by a tsunami in Japan. But maybe this time it's different. Maybe this time, with climate change and geopolitical concerns, we might actually see this promise surge in new nuclear construction. So what's driving this newfound momentum? That's where a new type of reactor design, one that's getting a lot of attention, comes in. They're supposed to be smaller, less expensive, safer, and better than traditional large nuclear plants. Some of these are completely new types that upend our previous approach to nuclear power. Governments and utilities around the world have been falling in love with small modular reactors, or SMRs, throwing money at them and trying to accelerate development and construction. It seems almost any project these days with SMR attached to it can get funding. But why is that? What is it about these designs that have caught everyone's attention? And if they're so great, why haven't we really seen any in action? We'll do this by answering four questions. First, what are small modular reactors? What problems do they solve compared to conventional large nuclear reactors? Do they compete against or fit in with renewables like wind and solar? And finally, will we see the realization of all this investment by actually building these plants? First, what are SMRs? As the name implies, small modular reactors are, well, small. They're generally considered to be nuclear reactors with electrical output of less than 300 megawatts, compared to the upwards of 1600 megawatts of large conventional reactors. This obviously means there can't be a one-to-one -one replacement of large plants, but what they lack in size, they make up for in number. For example, old coal plants undergoing decommissioning are often a similar size to SMRs, meaning the existing electrical infrastructure like transmission lines is readily available. Also, it's not always possible to drop gigawatts of power into one location, especially if the electrical grid can't support it or a demand for that kind of power isn't there. The other part of small modular reactors is the modularity of the design, meaning they're relatively easy to build and expand by adding more units as needed. This allows a utility to flexibly scale generation with predictable construction timelines and costs. Since the majority of SMRs are designed to be fabricated mostly in factories, compared to the heavy construction projects of traditional plants. Scalability and predictable costs are obviously two factors that are going to be appealing to utilities, and these are things that large nuclear plants have historically struggled with. See the recent experience in Finland, which started construction of a large plant in 2005 and isn't expected to be commercially operational until at least 2023, which means they have spent nearly two decades building only one plant. So, with that in mind, what problems do SMRs solve? Large conventional nuclear plants have been around for decades, and love them or hate them, they provide a big portion of the low carbon electricity in a number of countries like the US, France, Canada, China, and many others. However, there are some notable disadvantages that have become clear as we operated these large plants. The safety record is generally very good. Now, make no mistake, there have been large accidents like Chernobyl and Fukushima, but on a per-energy basis, nuclear is remarkably safe. This safety, however, is managed through many things like regulations, large emergency planning zones around the plants, complex safety systems, and government and public acceptance. Large plants are also very expensive to build, requiring huge upfront capital, often billions of dollars per unit. And long construction times have added uncertainty as to when a new plant might actually start generating electricity, as we saw in Finland. The current design of most plants produces a fair amount of radioactive waste in the form of spent nuclear fuel. Although there are ways to deal with it, it still will be around for thousands of years. There is also the ongoing risk of proliferation, or the diversion of material to make nuclear weapons. While the vast majority of civil nuclear programs are compliant with international agreements, there is no guarantee of political stability in all countries in the future, which could result in a rogue state or a terrorist organization obtaining nuclear material. And finally, large plants have a lot of complexity. They're big machines with complex operations and maintenance. And usually there are dozens of regulators that need to be satisfied over a long list of design and operability requirements. So, how well do SMRs address these problems? The thought behind SMRs is that, although the power output is lower, they can be built more cheaply and easily, with a lot of components being ready-made in a factory and then shipped to the site. Although there are many different designs, how well do they stack up against their big brothers? Let's start with safety. Because of the smaller size, the amount of fuel and radioactive material is less. Therefore, the large emergency planning zones around traditional reactors, which is the area that must have evacuation plans ready for people living nearby in the event of an accident, can be significantly reduced. 
The emergency planning zone for a traditional plant is usually about a 10 kilometer radius around the plant. SMRs can reduce this down to as little as 300 meters, which is much more practical. Further enhancing safety, most SMR designs are designed with passive safety systems. Traditional reactors operate with active systems in the sense that they involve active pumps, valves, switches, or plant operators to perform certain actions in response to a range of conditions. In SMRs, many of these systems operate passively by depending only on natural phenomena such as gravity or changes in temperature and do not rely on an operator turning on a certain pump at the right time. Because small reactors have a lot less heat to deal with compared to large reactors, much of the design for safety systems, such as emergency heat removal, is greatly simplified or not needed at all. A 2010 report by the American Nuclear Society showed that many systems in large reactors are not necessary for SMRs. In some cases, fast-moving accidents, such as loss of coolant accidents, or LOCAs, have been eliminated, and transient response is much more benign. Passive systems have other advantages. One of the main problems that affected Fukushima was the loss of electrical power from the grid and flooding of the backup diesel generators. This emergency power was needed to keep pumps running to cool the reactors, and without it, significant core damage occurred. In some SMRs, this cooling is achieved entirely through passive safety designs, eliminating the need entirely for emergency power from diesel generators. By building everything needed for safety into the main parts of the reactor, reliance on outside components or infrastructure can be greatly reduced. So given the overall improvements to safety and passive systems, we'll give this point to SMRs. Let's look at the second area, cost. There are two main methods used to compare the cost of different plants that are independent from the different types or designs. For example, if you wanted to compare the cost of a large nuclear plant to a wind farm or to an SMR, you could use these two methods. The first is what's called overnight capital cost, which is just a way to measure the cost of constructing the plant. It's as if one day there was nothing, and the next day, a power station popped up suddenly and was ready to go. Overnight cost is measured in dollars per kilowatt, or cost per unit of power that the plant is capable of producing. This allows a more or less direct comparison of the cost just to build the plant, right up to the point where it would start operating. The problem though with overnight costs is that they don't present the full picture, since it doesn't include things like fuel or paying for staff once the plant actually starts operating. That's why there's the second method, which is what's referred to as the levelized cost of electricity, which measures the lifetime cost of the plant. Here's a simple example. Let's say we have our own, very small plant that costs $1,000 to build, including financing, and it is expected to last 10 years. That would be $100 per year in capital costs that need to be paid back. Similarly, if we have annual operating expenses, like maintenance and fuel, let's say $25 per year, that needs to be added in as well. That brings our total cost per year to $125. Now, let's say that our plant produces 1,000 kilowatt hours or one megawatt hour of electricity on average for the year, including any downtime for things like maintenance or if it's nighttime at a solar plant. The levelized cost of electricity for this plant would be $125 divided by one megawatt or $125 per megawatt hour. The advantage of using this method is it allows a fair apples to apples comparison of the different types, since in the end, it measures the total cost of electricity produced. Hopefully that makes sense, but if not, just remember that lower costs, either overnight capital cost or levelized cost of electricity is better. All right, now getting back to SMRs. In absolute terms, total initial capital investment and ongoing operational costs are lower for SMRs than for large plants simply because they're smaller. Construction time should also be faster considering factory build on the order of one to two years. However, power output is also much lower. So what does this mean for the overnight costs and the levelized costs? NewScale, one of the companies designing SMRs, has estimated its overnight capital cost to be about $3,600 per kilowatt. Remember, this is just the cost to build the plant divided by its capacity. They compared this to the more than $9,000 per kilowatt for the recent large nuclear projects in Georgia and South Carolina, although these may be somewhat considered outliers compared to other large international projects. For example, the Koreans have demonstrated they can build the conventional APR1400 plant at around $2,150 per kilowatt, and China has built similar plants for around $2,500 per kilowatt. For the levelized cost of electricity, NewScale estimates their design will produce at power at around $65 per megawatt hour. So what do these numbers mean, and how do they compare against other sources? We'll stick to the US market for consistency and since it's pretty broad, but realize that there will be variations going from country to country. Nonetheless, in general, overnight costs on average are around $4,600 for a coal plant with carbon capture and $2,500 without. Gas plants are cheaper and come in at around $2,400 with carbon capture and about half that without. 
Onshore wind is about $1,300, offshore is about $2,500, and solar is around $1,100. For levelized costs of electricity, coal is about $51 per megawatt hour with carbon capture and $28 without. Gas plants are around $27 with carbon capture and $11 without. Onshore wind is about $30 and offshore is about $50. Finally, solar comes in at around $40. More specifically for nuclear, in 2017, the Energy Innovation Reform Project looked at several reactor designs with capacity between 47 and 1600 megawatts. They found the average overnight capital cost was about $3,800 per kilowatt, and levelized cost of electricity was around $60 per megawatt hour. Meaning NuScale is kind of right in the middle of the average of other nuclear designs, both large and small. So why do we see claims of cost efficiency from SMRs when really it doesn't look like there's that big of an advantage? Well, large plants, although complex, get cost efficiencies from economies of scale, building a few really large units. SMRs, on the other hand, get cost efficiencies from economies of production, similar to the aviation and shipbuilding industries. Think of it like comparing the cost of a mass-produced car to specialty hand-built cars. For nuclear, instead of a customized reactor, they can be built at a factory. However, you need to sell a lot of units to make this approach worthwhile. Which is why some studies find that in order to make up the difference, a vendor needs to sell a significant number of SMRs, estimated to be between 40 and 70 units. So if they can sell that many, then SMRs become more worthwhile. Overall, we can call the cost a draw, with a slight advantage to SMRs if they can move enough units. Alright, I know that was a lot of numbers, so let's move on to the next area, waste. Lower power means less waste overall, with some designs made using entirely new fuel sources compared to just the traditional uranium. But waste per power unit generated may not be as good, especially for some designs that are more conventional. Several SMR designs that are fast reactors may have better fuel utilization, significantly reducing the amount of waste. A certain type of reactor called a breeder reactor can convert otherwise useless material, such as uranium-238, into a usable fuel, allowing them to operate with the same fuel for a very long period of time, and therefore not making a lot of waste in the process. A good example of a breeder reactor is the traveling wave reactor by TerraPower. It simplifies the process by immediately using the fuel that it breeds without requiring the fuel's removal and cleaning, or reprocessing. By eliminating that step, the traveling wave reactor prevents creating additional waste, as well as neatly avoiding the proliferation issue. Similarly, other reactor designs using the thorium-based fuel cycle offer reduced long-term waste compared to the uranium cycle, not just in the amount, but also reducing the amount of time that it is highly radioactive. However, since not all SMR designs can take advantage of this more complex fuel, we'll call this one a draw for now. Next, proliferation. Nuclear proliferation, or the use of nuclear materials to create weapons, is still a concern for small modular reactors just like the large plants. Since SMRs have lower generation capacity and are physically smaller, they are intended to be deployed at many more locations, which means many more sites need to keep track of nuclear material. Since they are also expected to have lower operator and staffing levels, this could make them an easier target. Some designs are completely self-contained and operate with the same fuel for a long period of time, up to 20 years. This eliminates one risk in that the fuel is never removed from the reactor, thus reducing one avenue of proliferation risk. However, some designs, particularly those that use molten salt and fast reactors, achieve this by producing more plutonium, which can be a concern. There are designs that address these issues. Fuel can be low enriched uranium, or less than 20%. This type of uranium is difficult for weapons production, and thus much less attractive. Many SMRs can also be installed and sealed underground, therefore reducing the vulnerability of the reactor to a terrorist attack or a natural disaster. Some SMRs are designed for one-time fueling. This improves the proliferation resistance by eliminating the on-site fuel handling, which means that the fuel can be sealed within the reactor. This improves the proliferation resistance compared to conventional large reactors, which are required to take out and rearrange the nuclear fuel every 12 to 24 months. Since this one really depends on the design and fuel type, in the interest of fairness, we'll call this one a draw. Finally, what about the complexity of SMRs compared to large plants? The designs are smaller, with fewer components, and generally improve safety and proliferation. This means there is expected to be lower staffing and maintenance needs. It also means that the regulations, which are typically for large plants, will need to be adapted given the new nature of the designs. A major barrier to more widespread SMR adoption is the licensing process used by various government regulators worldwide. Since these processes were developed for conventional custom-built reactors, this has prevented the relatively simple deployment of identical units at different sites. After all, the idea behind SMRs is that factory building and modularity, so each one should be the same. But the current rules and regulations say that a complete review of each instance has to be done again and again, which maybe isn't the most efficient approach. For example, 
The U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission's process for licensing focuses mainly on large reactors. Design and safety specifications, staffing requirements, and licensing fees all have been geared towards reactors with electrical output of more than 700 megawatts. So no matter if you are building a 50 megawatt reactor or a 1000 megawatt reactor, the cost and fees paid to the regulator are the same even though one is much simpler and smaller than the other. The International Atomic Energy Agency, the Nuclear Energy Agency, and the World Nuclear Association all have placed an emphasis on creating a central licensing system for SMRs. This harmonization of international regulations could mean that once a design is approved in one country, it would automatically be, or with limited exceptions, accepted in others, which would greatly simplify things. So on complexity, I'll give it a point to SMRs, but put a little asterisk on there, depending on the international regulators. So overall, not too bad. All right, do SMRs compete against renewables? Climate change concerns, price volatility, and the intermittency of renewables have given an incentive to consider integrating SMRs into the electrical grid. This can be an optimal case that combines the advantages of renewals with the stability of nuclear energy. SMRs can operate as a flexible baseload supply that supports other sources like wind and solar that come and go with the time of day or the weather. When the wind isn't blowing, SMRs can pick up that slack. Now, on cost, you may have noticed earlier that the renewables have become very cost competitive and are often less than nuclear plants, particularly on the levelized cost of electricity. But it's important to remember that levelized cost of electricity isn't everything. Let's look at a hypothetical. If you were to search for the cheapest way to get from New York City to London, you would find that the cheapest option is to swim. Building and operating a ship is expensive. Designing an airplane and all the infrastructure it needs isn't going to be cheap. Yet not a lot of people are swimming across the Atlantic. Speed, reliability, safety, and comfort are other factors that we want and are willing to pay the increased cost to have those. The same is true for nuclear energy. The cost tends to be a bit higher, but in exchange, we get some very important things that we need, such as reliability. Nobody wants their lights or heat to go off just because the sun went down. And there are other things to consider, such as the land required for wind and solar. Wind needs about 170 times the amount of land for an equivalent nuclear plant, which may not be practical in all areas. And there are other applications like desalination, heat storage, hydrogen production, industrial heat, or district heating that nuclear is much better suited towards. I'm not saying that renewables have no place, quite the opposite in fact. I'm saying that having a system that has both nuclear and renewables, we can build one that takes advantage of the best from both. So why aren't SMRs everywhere then? The International Atomic Energy Agency has said, the market for large capacity power plants is limited to countries with grid capacity capable of accepting them. The market for smaller nuclear facilities has the potential to be an order of magnitude larger than for current full-scale nuclear power plants, given that most small countries either have small grids or are developing mixed generation grids. With billions of dollars invested in SMRs over the past decade, there is only one operational, the floating plant on a boat in Russia. Although to be fair, it is not such a revolutionary design, but more of a scaled down version of an existing Russian design. Remember, nuclear powered aircraft carriers and submarines have been operating on what are essentially SMRs since the 1950s and 60s. More innovative designs have also been worked on. New Scale, for example, has been in development since 2000. However, despite a steady supply of government grants, loans, and fresh investor funds, they have yet to actually build a reactor. They are currently under a permitting review for building a plant in Idaho, but it is merely a demonstration unit. For designers and suppliers intending to embark on creating an SMR, there is a long list of things to consider, like the user's requirements and priorities, the technology and coolant to be developed, any new applications, and what distinctive features will be attractive to the marketplace. These are not easy decisions, both from a research and technology standpoint, as well as a business standpoint. And as we've seen before, regulatory bodies also need to adapt to a new system. A versatile regulatory framework and guidance needs to be developed and in place regardless of the SMR technology design being considered. Generally, the largest difficulty is in being the first, although there has been some progress around the world. Like we said, Russia was first with its floating SMR, China has a high temperature gas reactor, and Canada has actually broken ground on a boiling water design in Ontario. Now, I've also mentioned New Scale a few times because it is one of the designs that has been well publicized. But as you've seen, there are others. If you have any interest in a deep dive on any individual SMR designs or types, leave a comment down below and let me know if there's any in particular you'd like to hear more about. So where do SMRs stand? Safety is generally improved by using passive systems like gravity and not requiring offsite power. Cost is also lower, but less power output means the cost per megawatt doesn't really improve much. 
Waste is potentially better with new methods and materials, but not all designs are using these. Proliferation is somewhat better in designs that eliminate transferring used fuel or encapsulating the reactor underground, but again, not all take advantage of this. And complexity is improved, but needs some updates from the regulators, which are still based mostly on large reactors. Because of their small size and modularity, SMRs could almost completely be built in a controlled factory setting and installed module by module, improving the level of construction quality and efficiency. If enough are built, costs for a specific SMR design would reduce further. Their small size and passive safety features make them attractive for countries with smaller grids or less experience with nuclear power. SMRs offer some great potential, especially as more wind and solar come online. It's easy to see why governments are excited and putting funding down for their development. How many of these projects and designs actually become reality remains to be seen, but it is certainly an exciting time, not just in the nuclear industry, but for everyone around the world in the fight against carbon emissions and climate change. If you found SMRs interesting, please give this video a like or subscribe for more content on nuclear energy. If you'd like to know more about nuclear power, you can check out these videos. And thanks for watching.